I want to talk a little bit about how we used to cut cane by hand and load it up on wagons and haul it into the mill by hand, you know, with the horses in the wagon and then feed the cane by hand through the mill and uh, that was just a tremendous lot of work. And uh, as a boy, I, I do, I will say, uh, even as a uh, uh, six, seven year old boy, I remember when I was in the first grade and my parents and aunts and uncles and neighbors were at the sorghum mill making sorghum. I, I just couldn't hardly stand it. Of course, my mind was not at school, in school at all. I, I just detested it even from the first grade on. I don't even know how I've made it this far in life, but I just detested it. But I, for some reason, I had a drawing to the cane field, and I wanted to, I wanted to go, be with them, help them strip and cut cane, and and load it, load cane on the wagon with the horses, and and haul it into the mill, and help press it. And my gosh, I could not wait till I was 12 years old. My dad told me I could have a, a team, a team in a wagon, and I could start hauling cane when I was 12 years old because another boy in the community was 12 years old, and he got to do got to do that and I wanted I wanted to be able to haul uh, load up a load of cane on a flatbed wagon and have the horses hitched up to it and haul it into the mill anyway I was just very passionate about it but as time went on um, uh, as I became a teenager I was uh, I somewhat got rebellious at it because I, I guess uh, uh, then I was expected to work and work hard I mean long days into the night cutting cane, loading it on the wagon, and hauling it in. And I've also been very blessed with uh, able to, uh, with, with, with uh, the ability to be able to uh, do construction work, build houses, barns, you know, um, most anything. And then, you know, welding, I, that was just uh, right down my alley. I just caught on to that really good self, -ed, you know, I just learned it myself. I didn't go to school anywhere for any of it, but I learned to weld and and uh, fabricate. Anyway, as I got to be an older teenager and I didn't have to work for dad anymore, I went out in the, in the world and I, I did my run at it. And uh, I, I did well at doing construction work and I did it long after I went back home and, and got back in the sorghum business. But about, I guess I was 20 or 21 years old, I realized that maybe dad had something good going there. And I was, as, I was a, as I was a teenager, I would dream at night, all the time, I would dream of building a machine that could be pulled with a tractor that would cut the cane, press the juice out of it, and pump the juice into a tank. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I guess in 1997, we started working on this machine, pulling parts out of other pieces of equipment, and built this whole thing. And so the main drive on this thing is a hydraulic pump off of a ready-mixed cement truck, the pump off of a ready-mixed cement truck on it, and then the gearbox on a ready-mixed cement truck. It has those large rollers, those rollers are 20 inches in diameter and 24 inches in length. And the head on it there that's cutting the cane off is a, is a, a corn head off of a silage cutter from a New Holland silage cutter and put all these pieces together and uh, it's quite rewarding. I mean, it's spent, lost a lot of sleep uh, doing all this work. My brothers pitched in there, we all worked at it together and we built this machine. Today, Isaac, my nephew, Eddie's son, is driving this nice tractor. His, uh, his sister, Charlotte, is on the back of the mill and she's running these, high, these controls, she has those those four hydraulic handles in her, on her hand, under her hand there. She controls the speed of the press, speed of the juice pump, pressure on the rollers. And then she has another handle right here where she uh, also controls the speed of the rollers. And she controls all that and occasionally she has to get off and uh, wipe the, uh, uh, the juice clear from, or the, the chaff that builds up on the sieve that strains and the juice is being pumped into this tank. But for many years, uh, as we were building this thing, you know, this thing doesn't come without troubles. I mean, yeah, to build all this stuff homemade, a um, lot of things to be learned, and some days I would wish, I wished I'd have, we'd have never started with this. I'd have just liked to have been out there with a machete, cutting cane again, 
It was just a lot more peaceful. But on a day like today, uh, when it's working so smooth, just keep driving. It keeps cutting that cane, pumping that juice, filling the tank a thousand gallons of juice in just a little over an hour. Absolutely fantastic. But part of the reason for doing all this uh, was just, you know, the way I grew up and uh, uh, Dad was very passionate about making sorghum syrup and, and there was just absolutely going to be no way that my generation, I and my brothers, were going to be able to make a living at cutting cane with a machete and hauling the cane into the mill. And uh, because of this equipment and modernizing along with it to cut out that physical labor, and what you see Charlotte doing there, she's just raking the chaff. It's just bits and pieces of cane uh, out of it. If you don't rake that out, the, the pump would plug up and then it would all be in the juice and be very, very nasty. Yeah, so it just sieves it. But I mean, we do strain it like four more times before it goes in the jar. But anyway, it did make a way for at least three of us brothers to be partners in this and, uh, and make at least a good part of our living, you know making and selling sorghum and and uh, without this modern equipment we wouldn't have been able to do it. We've gotten to where we like to clean this pan the day before. We used to do this um, in the morning early while we're getting the pressure going in the boiler but it's kind of it's kind of hard on you to get out of bed and come over here at three o'clock in the morning and clean a pan and be sweating at three four o'clock in the morning so we've gotten to where we like to have her all ready to go the evening before come over here and build a fire in the furnace and maybe drink sit and drink some coffee while it's heating up and get woke up good do you get started for the day at 3 o'clock in the morning? I uh, generally build a fire at 3, sometimes at 2.30. Well, you got to allow a little time to get up and get woke up. So, there's sometimes one of us gets up at 2 in the morning, sometimes 2.30. And then the other one, uh, generally the way we work it, one of us starts a fire, say, at 3 or at 4, whatever time we decide we're going to, because it takes about an hour to get the, uh, get the thing hot enough to pressure high enough to be going and in the meantime um, once the pressure gets up about an hour after we start fire the other one of us will show up whether it's Mark or myself or Eddie and then one of us will cook and the other one fires the boiler and the thing we've learned about that is it's a lot easier to for two of us to get out of bed early like that and get a jump start on it and get several hours of cooking out of the way rather than the whole family have to be here till late in the day. If we don't start early like that, it gets seven, eight o'clock on us. Everybody's tired. We try to work it so we get out of here. We're usually out of here by about six at night if it works out and get to go home and relax a little and get ready for the next day rather than working so late. It, it really makes everybody cranky. It's really hard on you if you have to work put in that long a day. So. so two of us can actually run this thing for a little while. One of us cooks and the other one fires the boiler. And the tank is big enough to hold the excess sorghum while we're cooking. And um, then they start bottling 8.30 to 9 o'clock. And they usually are caught up right about time we get done cooking they've about got everything bottled that we've cooked for that day and that typically runs anywhere from 375 to 425 gallons of finished product a day so it works out pretty good for us that way i know it's rough when you get up that early in the morning but the key to it is go to bed early enough the night before and get plenty of sleep and then you're okay you can do it and it's that's just the way it is it's harvest time you just put up with it you learn to do it make the best of it. Why does this tilt? To clean it. To clean it? To clean it, yeah. Because it's so wide and so big, um, we designed it on a hydraulic cylinder so it can be turned up on its side and it drains off good, it dries out. And then uh, when we start cooking in the morning, we just lay it down and turn the heat to it and start going.
<laughs> All right, so what we're doing here is uh, we're cutting firewood with this mobile firewood processor. And uh, basically is what we do is we fold that live deck up when we need to move it from place to place. And uh, yeah, we just load logs into that live deck and I, I can control that live deck forwards or backwards and I can grab it with this claw here and set the log length to how many inches, however many inches I need to cut it to. And all I do is just cut it and roll it into that split pin <laughs> and uh, run it through the splitter here. So uh, Charlotte brings it over on the tractor? Yep. Okay. She, uh, she loads the logs onto the live deck and uh you work inside that right uh -huh. there yep i'll show you the controls if you want to okay look at you can see how far that sawdust shoots out from the back of that blade there down into there so everything here except for the conveyor is controlled by these two joysticks so this joystick runs your claw and this joystick cuts it and dumps it into the tip pan and then that trigger is for the splitter. So I'll turn it on here. Just a little over 40 pounds, but it's enough to heat that juice that we're heating. I'm gonna haul these down across the road. We pile them up down there, and then somebody will come scoop them up with a tractor and a bucket, and either put them on a uh, on the field or a garden or something or other. So what are you going to do, Pete? Going to lop some heads. Lop some heads. That's the uh, seeds? That's the seed heads. Uh, this field has already been lopped. It's already been cut once, but uh, if it goes long enough, we retrim them just to get rid of the, the growth that's come back. So the biggest reason for taking the heads off, uh, well, there's a couple reasons. We don't like the seeds in there. They, they cause a lot of problems, a lot of trash, and build up a lot of plug up screens and pipes and stuff. And, give pump troubles but the biggest reason we get rid of the heads is to keep it from lodging so when those heads get up there like they are now and if the whole field is full of heads and it comes a, a little rain and that cane gets wet and then we get say 15 20 mile an hour winds it can knock it flat down or at least in patches it tangle it up mess it up real bad which in turn makes it really difficult to harvest so that is the biggest reason why we cut the heads off and so we'll cut them off sometimes if we see uh, the forecast for some after effects of a hurricane or some bad thunderstorms or some 20 mile an hour winds potentially we'll jump out there and cut a bunch of heads on cane that is far enough along to to get them so like i said this field has already been cut once but it it doesn't get them 100 percent you'll see that it missed some the first time and so it never hurts to run over it and, and retrim them but uh once you get them cut one time, it generally keeps the cane from going down. But we're going to show you all how it's how it's done, how we typically do it. 
straddle four rows and go right through the field and cut them off. That is a, uh, a Haggy, a high boy. It was originally um, designed to detassel corn. Uh, like for, for when they do seed corn, they, they jerk the tassels off to make uh, hybrid seed. And so it had a totally different header on it than that. We were able to buy that machine up in uh, Illinois, I believe it was. And it had a totally different head system on that. The, the, the heads that it's got, the cutter heads got on it, were designed to cut sugarcane heads. And so we had some contact with some folks down in Louisiana, and we were able to acquire a couple of those heads from them. And Mark and another guy basically replumbed everything and put the whole um, hydraulic system on it. So it's hydraulically driven, the whole machine. It has no brakes, it is totally hydraulic, forward, reverse. Um, of course, the heads, everything runs off the hydraulic. There's no chain driven, it's, it's all hydraulically driven. And so those cutters, they just spin. You can even spin them in reverse if you want to clean it out or anything, but they basically just spin one direction and gather the heads in and snip them off. And it, it really does a nice job uh, considering um, that we modified it. it like I said it does not do a perfect job but it does it does good enough we're, we're pretty well pleased with it sand and grit around there. Clean this up a little bit right here. Set that. It's a cam lock fitting right there. Just slips on there and pull that on there. And before I open it, I'm going to go check on my valves and make sure that I'm not going to run it out the drain. Yep, everything is good. And then I need to open this one. I'm going to go open it up and come back and switch the pump on. It's enough of a hill that it will free flow somewhat, but it takes a long time to run a thousand gallons out just, just gravity flowing. So we've got this little pump right in here. Switch that on and it pumps it. Look over in there and see it pumping it into the tank. Now, by putting the sun on, this is 
steam line coming in here. And I'm going to slowly open that up. This tank holds 3,000 gallons. It's a insulated jacket. It's like this thick and uh, double, double steel has insulation in between. And then the bottom has a welded on steam jacket. And that steam pressure from the bore down at the sorghum mill goes right into that underneath there and heats it. So it's very important to heat the juice uh, because so that's like mid 70s today and that plastic tank is probably got up to 80 or 85 degrees in a few hours it would spoil but by putting it in this tank and uh, heating it up to 150 160 it pasteurizes it and keeps uh, overnight the temperature will drop a little bit it'll get maybe 145 or something like that but that's what keeps the juice from spoiling on us till tomorrow and tomorrow this is the cookhouse down here and then tomorrow we have all stainless steel pipes hooked up and the juice will be flowed down into the mill and that's where we cook it. Field always end up with a little bit of overflow because the juice being so sweet it foams real bad and so that's all that it that's actually overflows it just comes out of this lid right here. Later on, I'll get right down inside this tank and clean it all out, wash all the foam and the... Let's find bits and pieces of cane that collect up. They actually pass through that sieve and there's just a lot of dirt that you have to get rid of. So right now, we'll just wait and let it pump into that tank and then we'll come back and clean this tank. Okay, so you were talking about as a kid, you had to clean that tank. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, I've been inside them tanks many times. You get down in there with a brush and the water hose, and you get soaking wet, it's hot, it's miserable, but I've scrubbed them tanks many times. I'm glad that Dad's doing it today because he can't make me do it anymore. 